Hello everyone, it's me, Juan, Gamer 54 back in another video. Today, today, yes, we're now watching Game Theory again. I know, shocker, but this time we're going to be tackling a subject that I, I think a lot of people, myself included, have been, normally haven't been talking about a lot. I am talking about the, the ARG known as Crow 64. Now, this isn't, this isn't the first time Matt had talked about Crow 64, he actually made a video way in the past, which I don't think I did a reaction video on. I may, I, I could have. Honestly, I feel like I, sh I could have done it. I might have to fact check on that. But, finally, four years, we're getting a sequel. So, without further ado, we're going to do a reaction video to it. So, make sure you sit down, make sure you get yourself relaxed, and let's do this, shall we? I feel like this is where we kind of have to wrap Catastrophe Crow. Is there a lot of stuff that we need to get to? Yeah, okay. but you know, this could also be a Tom oh task. God. I could send Tom these guidance documents that I found. Yeah. Or I withhold all of them and watch him suffer. Oh, let's watch him suffer. Yeah. Wow. Suffer, suffer, suffer. Here we go again. All right, let's do this. <laughs> Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the show that, like a crow, is always looking for shiny new theories. Although, while today's theory is definitely shiny, it isn't entirely new. Three years ago, we released a video on the criminally underrated game, Catastrophe Crow. This yeah. quote-unquote lost Nintendo 64 game was full of great puzzles, creepy symbolism, and more lore than you could shake a tail feather at. And over, let me see you shake a tail feather. And you got what? all of that without even having to play the game. Yeah, this was one of those pet scop situations where a bunch of YouTubers released videos about finding the game online. And using their footage, we were able to piece together the story of loss and desperation that was hiding beneath the surface. The okay, game yeah. code was eventually dropped online, and so people could play it for themselves and solve the last few remaining mysteries. But we here at Theorist figured that was pretty much the end of it. A cool one-and-done ARG that would slowly fall into obscurity as the internet continued to move forward that was until last year suddenly there was an official catastrophe crow plushie being released and with it really? a series of ads that teased something new coming april 26th lo and behold april 26th came around and the new thing we got was the game again i was kind of expecting something you know new i guess it is nice you don't have to be elite hacksaw to get the source code working anymore so naturally True. matt and ash checked it out on gt live and they were very keen to let me know that there was something more going on here Stopper, stopper, stopper. wow why were they not wrong there is so much more happening here than there ever was in the original there's now floating cat heads mysterious cryptic graves and buildings covered in corpses we got her boys, oh got her boys hanging out Hey guys, these guys do seem like they're ready to go. And I too am ready to go. Ready to go and decipher what the heck any of this means and figure out the true ending of this iconic ARG series, Catastrophe Crow. All Let's right. start with a quick refresher on what happened in the story all the way back in October of 2020. It began with YouTuber Adam Butcher releasing a video titled What Happened to Crow 64, where he reviewed the fictional history of an unreleased video game made for the N64. It was called Crow 64 and was made by a company called Opus Interactive. The All game right. was originally slated for release in 1999 and used an eternal revival system which supposedly would change the face of gaming forever. But as time went on, it was clear this eternal revival system was more than just a game engine. I mean, obviously, you don't pick a name like that in indie horror unless it's literal. The founder, yeah. Manfred Lorenz, suffered the tragic loss of his daughter Thea while he was developing the game. He wanted to use the eternal revival system to do just that, revive his, quote, little crow eternally inside the game. Manfred made a family of crows to represent their family. Manfred, his wife Marta, Thea, and her little brother Nils. Though, despite his efforts, it was all for nothing. He was unable to bring her back, only really capturing Thea's final dark days. And so, he dumped all the hardware into the ocean and then dove in himself. You'd think this would be where it ended. Sad parent tries to save their kid, fails, and can't take the guilt anymore. Yeah, so, so creepypasta. themselves as punishment. It'd be a sad but 
complete story. Except it yeah. wasn't the end for Manfred. In the original game, there was a screen that was full of blank spaces. If you found all the codes hidden within the game and decoded them from the game's crow language, which is just a simple substitution cipher, then you ended up with a message from Manfred to his dead daughter, telling her that he's sorry and how he is now trapped in a hell of his own creation, the game itself. His Ooh. eternal revival system had worked, and now he is forced to relive his grief over and over again. His Yikes. parting words are that this game is now for her brother Nils to play, which is why it feels weird to me that we are able to play it ourselves. If it was made specifically for Nils, then how is there a version available en masse? Feels like an invasion of privacy, almost. Then again, yeah. a corporation ignoring the wishes of its creator doesn't sound all that surprising, does it? So <laughs> I suppose we should actually jump into the game to see what we've got to play with. When you boot... I mean, let's be honest, like, it's, it's basically a must at this point that a indie company just ignores the wishes of their creators i mean shoot like how many times has fazbear entertainment come back despite the many many piles of children on the floor come on now at this point it's expected at this point of the game, you are met with a black screen full of blank text boxes, exactly like the one we saw in the first game. This yeah. is your main goal, to fill out those blank spaces. And to do so, there are some really cool puzzles to solve. But unlike our usual ARG episodes, where I walk you through each of those puzzles to get the ending, I actually don't want to spoil this one for you. We talked about this in our last video, but this game is criminally underrated, and the puzzles are so good and satisfying to solve that I'd encourage you to jump into the game and see if you can crack the codes for yourselves and then show the creator some love while you're at it honestly yeah. it is well worth it like there's this one puzzle where you end up walking through a maze and if you draw out your route it spells the code who thinks of that plus if you what? Suck, don't worry there's actually a whole google doc that's been put together by the community waiting to help you out no. so big shout out to everyone that helped put that together over there but for now let's get into the meeting give them the claps start off with everything feels familiar we're in the same major hub world outside of an office that we we can walk into. We yeah. hear the same ringing of phones and clickety clacking of keyboards. You can even find the same secrets in the same places, like the line on the floor that shows you where it's safe to walk, the path below Toyland, and the computer hiding underneath the flower bed. Everything is right where it should be. At least that's how it initially seems. Because oh, when no. you take a closer look, things don't quite match up. For example, the keyboard underneath the flower bed. In the original game, the players had to walk on the keyboard to highlight certain keys that would spell out a code in crow language. But in this version, and no keys light up at all. Not only that, but now next to the keyboard is a second door, and through it, a second keypad. And the code what? this puzzle is 332. How did the community figure that out? Well, it's because of who released this version of the game. The original was made by Opus Interactive, but yeah. this one is made by a company called Opus Legacy. Similar, but different, just like the Legacy. Game. They were also the ones who were making the official Crow plushie. I know, I shouldn't be pausing, but... What do you think about... Okay, so Opus Interactive, but now we got Opus Legacy. The Legacy is giving me an indicator that somehow Nils, the younger brother, or at least a family member, may have picked up the pieces of Opus Interactive and figured, hey, I want to, you know, carry on the legacy of Opus Interactive. So that's why we're now seeing Opus Legacy... It's the legacy of Opus Interactive. But, you know, that's how I'd be seeing it. Am I wrong? We're just going to have to wait and see. And do you want to guess how many they sold? 332. Using wow. that code unlocks an area that is full of conveyor belts and crow plushies. Clearly, this isn't the 1999 version of the game that we all saw back in 2020. This is a new version that has been altered by Opus Legacy. And they've made a lot more changes than just the plushie room. From here, the puzzles get tougher and the story gets so much more interesting. But before oh we boy. dive into that, I need to tell you about the sponsor for today's video, Opera. I'll dive into Katastrophe. All right, we're back new puzzles like in the forest world you can find a grandfather clock that clicks nine times and then 13 times if okay. you go and change your computer's clock to 9 13 when you spawn in the main hub it will be night time and manfred's house will spawn behind you everything in it feels like it did in the original game that is until you get to thea's room in oh the first no game, we saw a dying crow on a hospital bed before they got dragged away into the darkness but now we just see this weird floating cat head it doesn't do anything 
anything other than offer you six underscores before multiplying rapidly and crashing the game. For this to be replacing Yikes. her cryptic death scene from the original, it feels like Opa's legacy is trying to give us more details on what actually happened to Thea. In our video, we theorized that Thea fell down the stairs and suffered a brain injury, which yeah. is why our playable crow character has a broken wing and why we saw pieces of brain scans at certain points. But in this game, we don't just get snippets of the brain scan. We get the whole dang thing. And really? She doesn't have brain damage. What? If you make it to the hospital world, you can see the brain scan on the wall. And if you reverse image search it, you'll find an image called MRI brain tumor. So oh. those six underscores from the cat head become a abundantly clear cancer that is what the cat head represents it has the same weird fleshy texture you'd expect from a cancer cell and it keeps oh. multiplying until eventually your whole system shuts down just like the game does it wasn't brain damage caused by a fall it was a fall caused by her having a seizure due to a brain tumor man i feel so much worse for these characters knowing that this is what they were going through and to some degree i can even sympathize with manfred's desire to keep his daughter alive after she was taken from them far too soon but the changes yikes don't you may remember that after we fall down the stairs a scared okay i didn't expect we were going to get the big c right here but all right oh and i guess we're now going to be talking about how the brain the bird the crow here having a an episode is basically representation of what happened to fia like figure rushes towards you and crashes the game. This character appeared multiple times throughout the game. Sometimes it would just flee from you. Most of the time, it would swarm you like we just talked about. But this isn't just a random enemy. On Manfred's desk in the work building, we can find a Lorenz family portrait. However, when you walk away from the picture, it will briefly flash to an alternate image, replacing his wife Marta with the Scarecrow. This monster that attacks us or stops our progress in the original is Manfred's representation of his wife. After the death of Thea, their marriage fell apart. She left him, and based on his final note to her, it's implied that she took his only remaining child, Nils, with her. He Dang. saw her as a monster, someone that would halt his progress, someone that would only hurt his little crow family. And so he literally made her into the thing that is designed to scare crows, so that we as the players would also see her as the villain. But in this new game, wow. we get something different. The scarecrow does show up again and still flees from us occasionally, but we don't get swarmed by it anymore. That's crazy. Instead, during the desert world, it actually leads us to where we need to go, the Lorenz family home. Inside, you can find the Scarecrow sitting in the armchair peacefully, not attacking you, not resetting you, just watching. Marta's actions have been changed. Then, Which also f furthers the idea that it has to be Nils, who's basically running the head of Opus Legacy, because he wouldn't view his mom as the villain. Unless you mean to tell me that his mom decided to be, you know, evil and Nils is founding out about it. But I'm just saying, like, I'm, I'm firmly believing that Nils is the one who's running everything of Opus Legacy. Uh, that's just me. No longer that of an angry monster trying to hurt us, but helpful and caring, just wanting her little crow to come home. Unlike most sequels, it doesn't seem like these changes are being used to add to the previous story, but rather to challenge our ideas of what that original story was. That original story was from Manfred's perspective. We saw things the way he did and felt sympathy for him, but Opus yeah. Legacy is rewriting that story, showing us the truth behind these situations. How Thea died of cancer, how Marta was a good mother, and how Manfred wasn't there for any of them. But if Opus Legacy can tell us what the truth is, they would have to be someone who knows the truth to begin with. And from what we learned last time, we only have a couple of options. Manfred and Thea are dead, so yeah. it can't be them. It could be Marta. She would have known everything and likely wouldn't have been too happy with the depiction of her. But there's one more candidate who fits the bill way. Nils. Take another look at that picture from Manfred's office. When you move away, Marta isn't the only one who changes form. Nils also does. Nils becomes what has been dubbed a crawler, looking very similar to the Scarecrow, but crawling around on the floor. You gotta love beautiful simplicity. We often see it alongside the Scarecrow in the original game. Nils was often home with his mother and likely went with her when she left. To Manfred, Nils was being corrupted by his wife, turning him into a monster just like her. But how does this prove that Nils is the one behind Opus Legacy? Well, it has to be him. what I showed you guys right at the start of this episode? We got our boys. <laughs> the boys. Hanging out. Hey guys. 
the, the crew. The building that Manfred worked at in the original game is now infested with crawlers because Nils has taken over the business and is now the one working on the game, altering it to make sure that we see the full picture. His mother wasn't a monster. She was a kind and caring mother that just wanted to save her children from the monster her husband became. That's Dang. why you activate a switch that's out of bounds in the office, a new monster appears. A large and scrawny crow will begin to chase you around the office. And if you listen closely, you can hear the sound of low pitch crying. <laughs> This is how Nils sees Manfred. He cried over his daughter, spending countless hours in the office, endlessly pursuing her revival with the game. And so it seems fitting that Nils made this game's monster a deformed version of the Crow characters his father created. Even the change in the name reflects this shift in perspective. The word opus I told you. the phrase magnum opus, which typically refers to a work of art that is considered the artist's most important. Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, and for Manfred, it was Crow 64. The ability to save his daughter, save anyone, and allow them to live forever inside a game? That would be his magnum opus. Opus Interactive. But now we have Nils coming in as Opus Legacy. And Legacy is all about the impact that you, or your greatest work, leave behind after you die. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Sure, this game could have been Manfred's greatest work, but ultimately it turned him into a monster. And that is the legacy he left behind and now thanks to nils the whole world knows however nils story doesn't end there after he fixed all the issues he saw he continued adding things to the game that show us what became of him after his father's death if okay. you jump into the well you will find yourself in an underground maze surrounded by blood by opening one of the grates you can find four gravestones so you may notice that they're a little tricky to understand they're not written in english and it's not crow language either this is what is known as a dot cipher. The way you oh. write it is actually pretty simple once you get the hang of it. All you have to do is set these dots on a grid with a Y axis labeled from 0 to 9, with okay. the 0 being at the bottom and 9 being at the top. Then you just need to see what number each dot is aligned with on the grid. In this case, the numbers are dates like you would see on a gravestone, telling us the birth and death dates of these characters. The okay. first stone's death date reads as the 5th of December 2001, which is around the same time. Okay, so the game is based in Germany. Ocean. All right. So this must be his gravestone. With the rest, therefore, being Marta, who's still alive and doesn't have a death day, Thea okay. and Nils. But these aren't the only gravestones you can find. If you manage to clip through the floor, you'll find four more graves. So four? Are more? One grey, one pink, and two blue. The grey one is actually a repeat of Nils' grave from earlier, meaning that this is supposed to be his family. The pink grave has a close birth date to him, so this would be his wife. And then the two blue graves are from 2019 and 2020. His two children. Nils oh. has grown up. He now has a family of his own, and thankfully there's not a death date on any of these gravestones. Yay, so good job, Nils. Which means that he can be there for his children like his father never was for him. His legacy would be different. Except there was one last thing he had to do before that could happen. No. At the start, there are codes hidden throughout this game. If you could... No, 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 please don't tell me that Nils was sentenced to the gulag. Please. <laughs> Nils, you were just, you were do you were bound for greatness. You was correcting the wrongs. Don't tell me you about to fall. Collect them all and put them into the computer under the flower bed. You unlock the final cutscene. In it, we see four crows standing together. One grey, one pink, and two blue. Just yes. like the gravestones. This is Nils' family. And everything is fine until we see the Visionaire cipher from the original game flash on screen. The one from Manfred's note to Marta that translates to Nils, I'm alive. Oh, this message no. causes Nils' head to detach from his body and glitch out. He's been going crazy trying to figure it out how is his father still alive how can his father be reaching out to him and that i believe is the real reason he built this version of the game if you translate all of those codes from crow language it creates a letter from nils to manfred just like the one manfred wrote in the first game and it says this father i was so angry i could not reach you with the claws you gave me every year you drowned we ran and ran but we could not escape that silent house 
house. In the end, your little crows were only made as playthings to call you back once more. But now you have died twice, lost in the noise. So I build my own. I learn your language to warm the hell you built from the depths. With one last code at the start of the cutscene that says, not forgiving, but willing to take one last leap. The changes he made weren't just because they weren't the full Yeah, he vengeful. Manfred couldn't be found in the version he'd made with the tools Nils had been given. Nils said he died a second time, and we see that as a third date on Manfred's gravestone, the 5th of December 2020. The same day that the source code for the original game was released, and the same day we got this video from one of the ARG YouTube channels, Ultra 64 Forever, where we see Father Crow, Manfred, rise up through all of the worlds and disappear appear into the ether this was his second death when the source code was released manfred became unreachable maybe his soul within the eternal revival system was being split across too many copies of the game because suddenly everyone online had a version of it he became lost in the noise so nils did the only thing he could he started over he learned his father's crow language and built his own version of the game a version that only can be played from your browser meaning there's only one copy that is hosted in a single location. All of okay. this to try and guide his father back. And the crazy thing is, it worked. During the original really? ARG, the community found a working email address that they could send messages to. Doing so gave them a response from ML, Manfred Lorenz. And one of those responses was addressed to Nils, asking him to meet in the place they would holiday every year. After that email was received, we got two more videos from Ultra 64 Forever, showing Father Crow standing in a forest waiting patiently for Nils to find him, but nothing ever happened. That was until the community unlocked the final cutscene for this new version of the game. When that happened, Ultra 64 Forever uploaded one final video, and it was titled The, the end. end. We see Father Crow once again standing in the forest. Footsteps can be heard, and we see a small crow walk into frame. That small crow is Brother Crow, the crow character that has represented Nils within the crow family. The two crows turn to each other and begin to talk as the screen fades to black. Nils' plan had worked. He took nice. the last leap and this time was able to find his father where he promised he would meet him all those years ago. Manfred was back, no longer lost in the noise. He got the meeting he always wanted. He could say all the things he wanted to say and maybe, finally, he could rest. As for Nils, he may not have forgiven his father for what he did to him or his mother or to Thea, but he was at least willing to talk it out with him one last time. And now that message that was driving him crazy for so long would no longer have any power over him. He did what his father asked him to do and he found him. Now Nils can finally move on and with his family start creating his own legacy instead of living in someone else's. But hey, that's just a theory. A game! Hey. Nice! I'm not gonna lie. I feel like that's a good way to end off the whole Crow 64. Or catastrophe, catastrophe, I can't speak. But yeah, that, that's pretty cool, actually. I mean, like, this is not even a theory at this point. I'm pretty sure this is legitimately facts at this point. Nils finally got, Nils finally basically finished his story. He finished it. And now he can basically move on. Although, what does that happen to do, so what's going to happen to Manfred? Like, is he alive now, or... I know, I'm slow, I'm sorry. Because it's like, it's making me, it's thinking like, either he's alive, like he found the source code, he, he found the source code that has Manfred, or Manfred is somehow still alive, like physically, but I'm going to say maybe he found him digitally, and the whole meeting was just, you know, talking through computers and source codes and stuff. Again, I'm slow, I'm sorry. But... I'm not gonna lie. Congratulations, Nils. Congratulations. I give you a standing ovation. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the end of Crow 64. Not gonna lie. That was impressive. And I, you know, I'm now wanting to play 60. I now want to play Crow 64. But honestly, I gotta give the salute to uh, the person who created Crow 64. That was spectacular. That was sensational to say the least 
But anyways, guys, that's going to be the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you like the video so I know you guys enjoy. Comment down below. What do you guys think? I honestly think that this could pretty much be the end of Crow 64, to be honest. Like, if they make another game, I will be very surprised. But, you know, again, there. I feel like I also made a reaction video to the first part. So, I'm going to go and check to see if it's true. And if, if it is true, I'll leave it in the pinned comment. But anyways, be sure you subscribe as well because, you know, we're trying to upload daily. This is Juan Gamer 54 signing off.